Just to give you a heads up, in today's episode, one of our guests mentions something that's more suited for a mature audience. We don't go into any detail at all, but we want you to be aware in case you're listening with young children or more sensitive listeners nearby. Welcome to 78.4, the podcast that helps you leave a godly legacy for future generations by showing you incredible things God has done in the lives of men and women around the world. If he can do those things in these people's lives, imagine what he can do in yours. I'm Bob. And I'm Matt. Today, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I think most people, tell me if you disagree, we get Jesus. We we, we understand who he is. And we get the concept of who God the Father is. But the Holy Spirit, eh, eh, (laughs) it's it's a little more mysterious, correct? Exactly. It's a little it's a little confusing. He is, not it. He He is. is. Exactly. See? I'm calling him I'm calling him it. It did not help. It did not help Bob. That when I was in the Lutheran church growing up, they did not even call it the Holy Spirit then. They called it the Holy Ghost. So as a kid, imagine me thinking, God's haunting me now. I, it can be confusing. It's the, idea. Right. the idea is the Holy Spirit can be mystifying. So our hope today is to demystify the Holy Spirit, to help us better understand who is the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do, and what part does he play in helping me live what I'm called to live, a Christ-filled Christian life. Which is not easy to do. No. In fact, I remember reading the, the Sermon on the Mount. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, wait, this is impossible. The, the Sermon on the Mount is all about the Christian life. But you can't live the Christian life the way Jesus lays it out. If I lust after a woman, I'm as guilty as if I commit, uh, committed adultery. If I'm angry at somebody, I'm as guilty as if I had uh, murdered this person. Murder. And so how are we supposed to live this abundant, victorious life Jesus promised when there's absolutely no earthly way to do it? Yeah, we're all in trouble. Yeah, exactly. It's, Jesus promised us an abundant, victorious life, right. and yet there's no way to do that. Right. And the answer is the Holy Spirit. And again, we, we understand the Father, right? The Father gave us a, a set of things he wants us, to, how he wants us to live. He, he laid that out. Jesus, we get that. He was perfect. He did it in our place. But what about us? How do we do it? We, we, we can't. We, we literally can't. We ain't Jesus. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And hopefully through our guests today, we can get some clarity on exactly how the Holy Spirit works. Our first guest is Vonette Bright. Now, in the Christian world, Vonette was Wonder Woman without the tiara and the indestructible bracelets. <laughs> she was named Christian Woman of the Year. She spearheaded the National Day of Prayer Task Force. In fact, she was really critical in getting that going. Mm-hmm. Was chair of the Luzon Committee for World Evangelization. She wrote books and hosted her own radio show. And biggest of all, in 1951, along with her husband, Bill Bright, they founded Campus Crusade for Christ, now known as Crew in the U.S., which is one of the largest interdenominational Christian missionary organizations in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, when God called them into ministry, Bill was a businessman. He had a candy company, (laughs) and Vonette was a school teacher, and they didn't know anything about ministry, really, (laughs) especially about the Holy Spirit. Right. Dr. Edwin Orr had come, had moved to Los Angeles, and he had a real emphasis in his message about the Holy Spirit and about how um, it's uh, the Spirit dwelling within us. And uh, these, this was a new concept. We weren't hearing much about the Holy Spirit. We, talked, we heard people talk about the Holy Ghost, but that was not really understood. It was a thing that was not, not really very emphasized very much. But I was struggling with making this really real in my own, my own life. And um, I, I wanted to be holy. I wanted to be 
able to be on top. I wanted to be able to say I was living the Christian life, but it was, it was a struggle. And, uh, and I knew that it shouldn't be a struggle from what I was hearing of the Spirit-filled life. And, um, and yet, how do you make it different? Oh, I remember uh, one of the funny things that happened that uh, by this time we had two children and um, uh, I was feeding them their breakfast and the telephone rang rather early before nine o'clock in the morning and uh, that I thought, oh, this telephone, it just is incessant, it's just ringing off the wall. Why don't people leave us alone? Why do they have to call at this early hour of the morning? And uh, I thought I could just rank that thing out of the, rip that thing out of the wall. And, uh, and then as I got on the phone, as I answered the phone, I answered, hello, you know, happy, happy. And uh, the person on the other end of the line said, oh, it's always so great to call your house. You are always so up, Vonette. It was Cliff Barrows, who was the song leader for Billy Graham. And I thought, oh, how impossible, how impossible is this? I, I remember uh, just trying so hard to be the wife that Bill Bright wanted me to be, but I was working myself half to death, and I was in my own strength. Bill, Bill knew the reality of the Holy Spirit in his own life, but he did not know how to tell, tell it to other people, and he really didn't theologically fully understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So he, he was collecting every book he could possibly find from uh, any writing of Andrew Murray, um, E.M. Bounds, any of the theologians of the past that had something on the Holy Spirit and insight into the scriptures about the meaning of the Holy Spirit. And so we took a vacation, of, took three weeks to go to the, the beach. Bill immediately when we got there and unpacked, he had been sh saving shirt boards <laughs> from the cleaners that are, had a piece of cardboard in it, and he'd been saving those. He liked to make notes on those, and they made a good writing pad. So he had been saving stacks of these shirt boards, and so he took this, all of his books on the Holy Spirit, and he took these shirt boards, and he began that night, even before, after we were unpacked, I went to bed and went to sleep. I don't know how long Bill worked, but... He worked around the clock as much as he possibly could in devouring these books that he had and trying to make it the, the Holy Spirit understandable not only to himself, but in a way that he could explain it to others. And I think that message transformed the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ, for, for all of us. I, I learned that, you know, I couldn't keep from losing my temper over certain things. But God could, and I learned to depend upon the Holy Spirit's control. Colossians 3, you know, to just allow Christ to control your life, that let him live his life in and through you. Uh, giving thanks in all things, for this is the will of God concerning you. Um, we could go on and on in terms of the practical things that in, in giving thanks, praising God in the difficulties, allowing him to control the circumstances, to give in quickly, and, uh, and just to, I don't think of any better way to say it than just to allow him to live his life in and through us. It takes the struggle out of the Christian life. And it gives so much more strength than you know that it's not you doing it, it's God doing it. But through the, uh, the practice, really, of allowing Christ to control our lives, it's been the salvation of our ministry. And I think the greatest contribution probably to the cause of Christ that Bill has made is in the area of believing God for the impossible and, and depending upon the Holy Spirit. I think Bonnet explained everything really well. Just the idea of we can try on our own or we can let God do it and God's God and he'll do it better. And basically, um, she was talking about the concept that, that her husband Bill Bright called spiritual breathing. So what is spiritual breathing? It turns out it's not, as I originally thought when I first heard the term, it's not blowing blessings at people. Bob. Blowing blessings? You thought it was blowing you, blessings? You didn't think that was? No. Didn't come to you? <laughs> no, not in the no. least. No. I, but when I found out what it was, spiritual breathing is actually way cooler. 
It's simply seizing the moment, the, the bad desires, the impulses, the fears, whatever in that moment is a struggle for you, exhaling that to God and then inhaling, letting God come in and take over with his power to overcome whatever the struggle is. And, and we do this moment by moment in our lives. The idea is simply that when you sin, you exhale, you confess, you tell God, you know what? I know that I've sinned. I know that I've done this. God, I'm sorry. And then you inhale. He's like, Lord, fill me again with your, your spirit. Use your spirit to empower me to not, to not sin again. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God knows we're going to sin. Right. That's the whole point. That's why we needed Jesus in the first place. <laughs> well, exactly. And it's why we need the Holy Spirit now, because even though I am saved because of Jesus' sacrifice on my part, I'm still an idiot. I'm still going to mess up. I'm still going to sin. And yet he called us to be Christ-like. So he's asked us to do something that would be impossible if it wasn't that he also offers us his Holy Spirit living in us that we can go to anytime those moments happen. Exactly. So, I mean, it, it's as simple as letting the Holy Spirit who lives in you take over. Or is it so simple to actually give control to God, right? That's the hard part for all of us. And it was the hard part for our next guest, Rick Shell. When after just becoming a Christian, he had his vices, just like we all do, and he didn't know what to do with them. And here's what happened. I dated this existential agnostic. And uh, what an existential agnostic is, is somebody who's confused about whether God exists. And one day in one of our conversations, she said, Rick, is there a God or isn't there a God? And I said, well, if you believe there is, then there is for you. And if I believe there isn't, then there isn't for me. She said, cut the crap. He's either there or he's not. Which is it? <laughs> Frankly, I didn't know either, so I was just as confused. But right about then, they had this thing called the Vietnam War, and I got drafted. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, you can get killed in those things called wars. And as a result of that, I started thinking a little more seriously about God and life and what's right, what's wrong, what am I willing to live for, what am I willing to die for, those kinds of things. And uh, fortunately, I didn't go to Nam, and I was able to take a semester off from school. And as I did that, I lived in San Diego, and I read on Camus and Sartre and Hess, and I read on Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Jainism, you name it, every religious thing except Christianity. And, uh, and there I met another woman smarter than myself, and I married her. And uh, on our <clears throat> one of our dates, she talked to me about Jesus and that he rose from the dead, and that made him unique from all the other religious uh, leaders. And she was sitting far, far away from me <laughs> in the car. And she'd been really smart. She wouldn't have been in the car with me. And so on this side of my brain, I'm thinking about a hot date with somebody else. And she's talking to me about the resurrection. And I said, look, I can't prove or disprove the resurrection. And she, she said, well, what are you waiting for? One last fling? And I was like, ow, somebody stabbed me in the heart. So that night I sat down on my bed and I said, okay, Jesus, you're real. You can forgive sin. I got lots of that. You come into my life, you change me, and you got me. And uh, woke up, didn't feel any bells or whistles or anything, and I saw another Christian girl, and she said, do you think Jesus would lie to you? I said, no, I don't think Jesus would lie. She goes, why don't you thank him for coming into your life? I went, okay, Jesus, thank you for coming into my life. And from that moment, things began to change. And so the first day as a believer, I prayed and I said, you know, okay, God, what do you want to do in my life? I read my Bible and prayed. And he said, I want the profanity issue. So I gave him one little dot of my life in the sense. I'd already given him basically my whole life, but now he specifically wanted the profanity area. I said, Heck, I don't know how to change that. You, you, you take it. I can't do it. And that day, my profanity dropped off immensely. And then within a week, it, it really was gone. Well, 
The second day I got up and read my Bible and prayed and God said, I want you out of the fraternity drug ring. So I gave him another little dot in my life and I went to my fraternity brothers and I said, okay, uh, guys, look, uh, you keep all the money except the 600 I gave you, you got all the profits, I'm out. And they were like, all right, that's more for us, you know, good. And so I gave him that area of my life, okay. The third day of my Christian life, I got up and read my Bible, and, and this has literally happened in three days. Okay, this is not, I'm not making this up. Read my Bible, prayed, and God convicted me about the relationship with the <clears throat> other sorority girl and said, I want Susie. And I went, no, I'll take care of Susie myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> needless to say, uh, we uh, did what boys and girls do. And uh, all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit left me. And this was known as uh, quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. And so Susie and I had sex. And uh, then all of a sudden, it's like I was t tight inside again. And I was. not happy and I end up at a fraternity party and I end up in the kitchen getting a beer with a guy and uh, we get to talking and he turns out to be a Christian and I said hey I became a Christian three days ago or so and uh, uh, but it's like like Jesus left me and he said to me he goes well what'd you do I go, what do you mean what did I do and I said I, I don't know that I did anything. Yeah, yeah, you got sin in your life. What is it? You know what it is. And I go, well, I don't really. I'm, yeah, yeah, what was it? I said, well, is it wrong to have sex with a girlfriend? You know, he goes, yeah, it's called fornication. <laughs> and he says, you need to confess that. Confess that? What do you mean confess that? You need to call it what God calls it. You need to say, God, I was wrong for having sex with Susie and fornicating and you need to let God have Susie. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't even know you guys, some dude from some other fraternity, and he's telling me, they're saying, okay, so you wanna do that right now? And I go, right now? Yeah, pray about it, right now. I went, well, yeah, I, I guess. I, yeah, I wanna get Jesus back, wherever he went, I mean, you know. And, uh, and so we sat there at the table and we prayed, and I prayed, and I said, okay, Jesus, I was wrong to have sex with Susie, and, and uh, I'm, I'll give you Susie, and I'm sorry that I fornicated with Susie like that. In Jesus' name, amen. And he says, okay, well, you make sure you tell Susie that, you know. And I went, okay, felt better. Next day, I saw Susie, and I said, hey, Susie, I've become a Christian, can't be doing the sex thing anymore, and she cried and ran out of the room and, and, and whatnot. So... Anyway, uh, that's how I learned about confession and repentance and yielding, and God put this guy in my life. So now on like day five of my life, God's got a hold of the profanity area, he's got a hold of the drug dealing area, he's got a hold of the, the uh, uh, fornication area, you like that, and so my life is starting to conform more to the image of Christ. And so it's a process. So 20 years later, I'm headed off to, I'm in full-time Campus Crusade work. I'm off to share Christ with somebody. I had to cut across three lanes of traffic and I scare the bejeebers out of these three cars, you know, cause I'm running late. And I squeal around and there's cars coming onto the freeway from, and first car, second car, and the third guy is a motorcycle guy and as I, cut around in front of him, he gives me the brotherly sign of love and affection. Also his IQ, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, the point of it is, he's, he's given me that wonderful sign like that. I have my truck window rolled up and I said, and F you too, buddy. And all of a sudden, you know, people go, wait, 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 I thought you dealt with that on the first day. I, I hadn't said that word in 25 years or 20 years or whatever it was. You can still sin in all those areas that you yield to God. And so 
I'm started up there and the Holy Spirit goes, nah, you don't want up here. I went, you're right. Father, I was wrong. I was impatient. I returned evil for evil. I shouldn't have spoken the profanity at this guy and I'm totally wrong on that. I, I confess all that to you. The distance in time between when I was convicted and when I dealt with it was 20 seconds, not two weeks or a week or whatever it is. And the point is this, the distance in time between when you're convicted of sin and when you deal with sin is an evidence of spiritual maturity. Some people it's one day, some people it's two weeks, some people it's three months, five years, like that. But if you've been convicted, you need to deal with it quickly. It's like, oh, I just have to cooperate with the Spirit in this process. Now, Rick talked about it feeling like God left him. Notice he said it felt like God left him. Right. God never did leave him. It was just how Rick felt. And this is so critical for every one of us. We can never, ever forget that Jesus promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. You know, Paul wrote, and I love this, it's in Romans, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Right. That means that once you are truly his, you're not going to chase God away when you sin. But your sin can block you from hearing him. Right. And that's what Rick was going through. God chose to be silent so Rick would realize his sin. And then once he confessed his sin, the fellowship with God was restored. His ability to hear God was restored. That's why spiritual breathing is so important. Right. I think of spiritual breathing or the spirit-filled life like this. The Bible talks about, it says, we shouldn't be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, to me, that verse isn't so much about drinking as to tell us a, a kind of a way that we're supposed to use the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, and the idea is when when you're drunk, you're... Under the influence. You're under the influence. And that's... And exactly. So... Exactly. It's, you know, what is controlling you? Right. When you are drunk... You are under the influence of alcohol. It controls you. And God's saying, don't let anything control you, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Give God control of the moment whenever sin arises, and he'll give you the power to live a spirit-filled life. Well, it's not just sin, too. It's also be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of your life. Right. And that brings us to Bailey Mark Sr., Bailey was a businessman in Birmingham, Alabama, when he gave his life to Christ, gave up his business, and joined the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ. In time, Bailey was responsible for all of Cruz Ministries around the world outside of the U.S. and Canada. There's no way to overestimate the impact of Bailey's life on the world. He was a man who exemplified the power of a spirit-filled life. Very soon I'll be 76 years old and I'm mentoring a, a gentleman who is close to my age, he's 72, and he just came to know the Lord. And this guy's just like a sponge and I meet with him just one afternoon a week and we have, we sit and talk over coffee and talk about his problems in life and he's still working in one thing and another. But the other afternoon he just looked across the table and he said, Bailey, he said, you know, I just want you to know my life has been totally transformed. And uh, I said, well, I, I know it was because you received Christ. He said, yes, but I'm not talking about that. And he had the same thing I had experienced when I discovered the spirit-filled life and spiritual breathing, that I was more excited about that than I was when I met Jesus. And I know that may sound crazy, but just as far as how it affected my life and what I could see, and he said, spiritual breathing has just transformed my life. He said, I just used to chew people out that worked for me and what have you. And now I just patiently listen to them and talk things through and what have you. And he said, it's, I said, well, it's all because of Christ. He said, yes, but Christ living within me. 
And I, I know in my own life, when I discovered how I could live a victorious and fruitful Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, it totally transformed my life. My prayer for you is that if you're not walking in the power of the Spirit today, that you will just stop wherever you are, confess your sins, and ask God to fill you with the Spirit and say you want to be, breathe spiritually every day for the rest of your life. Can't say it any better than Bailey just did. That living the Spirit-filled life is something we do moment by moment every day of our lives. Give them control. God can handle it. You can't. But by faith, by, by inviting the Holy Spirit into your life, God promises to empower you to overcome any struggle and to live a transformed life. You know, it kind of reminds me, I've heard old country guys say, my daddy taught me how to swim by picking me up and throwing me in the pond and say, okay, swim, boy. Wow. And, <laughs> and a lot of good that does you. No. God doesn't do that. Okay. He doesn't throw us out into life and go, okay, swim, make, right. make the best he of it. He doesn't say, I'm going to set you up for a failure completely. No, what he does is he's in the water with us. Hmm. And he's saying, here, grab hold of me. I'm going to swim us back to shore. You know, Vonette talked about how allowing the Holy Spirit live through her took the struggle out of the Christian life. Right. Rick talked about the importance of confession and spiritual breathing and how that affects our communication with God. He really put the idea of spiritual breathing in practical terms. Right. And then Bailey spoke of how the Spirit-filled life transformed him and his friend. Mm -hmm. Now, those stories are just scratching the surface of who the Holy Spirit is and the roles he plays in our lives. Right. So although that ends our episode for today, the Holy Spirit is so much more than we discussed today that we will next week do part two. Part two. On the Holy Spirit. That's right. Our first official two-parter, Bob. We've and, got sequels now. <laughs> you didn't even know it, did you, listener? So tune in next week. Where do, they, do people tune in anymore? You don't tune like a radio. You would tune in. Do people still say tune in? Well, either way, tune in or or push the button that says seventy eight four, where we will continue the conversation and talk about how specifically the Holy Spirit empowers us as Christians. If you're still not sure how to spiritually breathe or live the spirit filled life, please check out our show notes. We have links to a wealth of information in articles, devotionals, and even a video to help you get a better understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, how to spiritually breathe, and how the Spirit brings power into your life. And the audio you heard today comes from some of the more than 400 and growing videos that we have on our website, legacy.crew.org. That's legacy.cru.org. We also have a YouTube channel, Crew Legacy, and a Facebook page. Please check those out. And if you like today's podcast, we ask that you please subscribe so you can get the next episode and the next and the next. 78.4 is a podcast of Legacy, a project of Crew. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. And while we're away, we want to encourage you to remember that whatever God did in the lives of the people you heard speak today, he can do in you. So until next week, go out there and continue the legacy.